Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Jay. I think the message is clear. Keep it simple and truthful. Our next speaker is Steve Gorham, who's a speaker, author, and researcher on environmental issues, as well as an engineer and a business executive. He is the executive director of the Climate Coalition of America, a non-political association of scientists, engineers, and citizens. Their mission is to inform other citizens on issues regarding energy and environment. Steve is the author of Climatism, Science and Common Sense, and the newly upcoming book, The Mad, Mad World of Climatism. And you just heard from Jay, what is nature's most abundant greenhouse gas? Of course, it's water vapor. Now, I'm going to be a little more conservative here. Uh, Many scientists say that about 70 to 75 percent of the greenhouse effect is caused by water vapor and clouds. Uh, Will Happer of Princeton says that. Jay would put it at about 95 percent of the greenhouse effect. Uh, this is uh, data from Gavin Schmidt of uh, NASA. If we say water vapor and clouds is about 75 percent of the greenhouse effect, then the last quarter is carbon dioxide and methane. But then we need to ask, of course, well, how much of that is due to man-made emissions? because the oceans have dissolved naturally 50 times the amount of carbon dioxide as is in the atmosphere. And the oceans are always releasing carbon dioxide and absorbing it. When plants grow, they absorb carbon dioxide. And when they die, carbon dioxide is released. And then we have volcanoes, both above the surface of the ocean and about 10 times as many under the surface of the ocean that are putting gases like carbon dioxide into the environment. So if we look at that last quarter, it turns out that about 96% of, of those emissions are due to natural causes from the oceans, volcanoes, and the land. That means that the man-made portion of the greenhouse effect, from my conservative point of view, is about one part in 100. One part in 100 of the greenhouse effect is caused by human emissions. That means we probably, if we stopped all emissions, we could not detect the difference in Earth's surface temperatures. Now we'll go on to the futility. The futility is renewable energy. In 2010, the world had 160,000 operating wind turbines across the globe, millions of solar installations, and these provided less than 1% of the world's energy. Here's a pie chart from the International Energy Agency for 2009. 81% of the world's energy was provided by hydrocarbons, and that was basically unchanged for the last three years. And you can see that uh, uh, solar and wind are in that tiny red sliver there, less than 0.8%. And here's a concrete example. This chart shows the amount of electricity added to the U.S. grid over the last 15 years. And each one of these little red squares is a million megawatt hours of electricity. Natural gas has been the leader, coal second, wind third, solar fourth. Over the last 15 years, we've added more than seven times as much electricity from hydrocarbons as we have from wind and solar, despite the rapid growth of wind and solar, despite all the subsidies and mandates. And if you will, look at that little solar block there. Solar by any stretch of the, we'd all love solar to power our nation, wouldn't we? But by any stretch, solar is absolutely trivial, trivial in our, in our energy situation. Now, one of the reasons that you haven't heard at the conference, why, why is wind and solar uh, not that effective, it's because those sources of energy are dilute. And that means they require huge amounts of land to deliver the same energy as hydrocarbons. I've, in my new book, I've compared five different power plants and to produce the same energy from a solar plant, you require 75 to 100 times the land of a traditional hydrocarbon or nuclear plant. For wind, you require 200 to 250 times the land. Now, I'm an engineer. I'm a pretty simple guy. Power plant A has one unit of land. Power plant B has 100 units of land. Anybody can tell me which one is a cheaper source of energy. Even if photovoltaic cell prices go to zero, Solar is still going to be more expensive than traditional fuels. Yet we have solar madness around the world. 
Uh, we heard about it from Minister Helmer in the UK this morning. Uh, there's also solar madness in Germany. The uh, German government has had feed-in tariff subsidies for more than 20 years, five times the price of regular electricity, more than one million rooftop solar installations. Today produces less than 1% of Germany's energy. And the capacity factor, that's the percent of rated output, is 8% for those solar installations. The only place it's worse is the UK where it's 5%. Yet, nevertheless, the German government has run up subsidy obligations, guarantees out to 20 years, of over 100 billion euros, which led uh, Jürgen Grossman, CEO of RWE, to say, to produce solar power in Germany is as sensible as to grow pineapples in Alaska. But we got to be green, right? By the way, is this what we mean by sustainable? How about this one? Or maybe this one? Is this what we're going to do? We're going to cover our world with, with wind turbines and solar cells that require hundreds of times more land than traditional power? It would seem to me what's sustainable is to use the concentrated energy that you can build near the city instead of, instead of at some desert 300 miles away that you got to run power lines to. Somehow we got this all upside down. Well, let's talk a little about the, wack about the wackiness, and there are a lot of examples. Spain has done the impossible. The solar providers in Spain delivered solar energy from November 2009 to, to January 2010, 4,500 megawatt hours between midnight and 7 a.m. Environmentalists rejoice at this prospect and this breakthrough of extending this across the world. But of course they found that they were hooking up diesel power generators to the solar systems to take advantage of the tariffs, which were seven times the regular uh, electricity rates, not only at night, but also during the day. And uh, Rajendra Prachari, the IPCC chairman, says, meat production represents 18% of global human-induced greenhouse gas emissions. Dr. Prachari is uh, a, vet a, uh, a vegetarian, would like all of us to be that also. I hear Dr. Prachari's coming out with a new book, 101 Climate Safe Recipes, <laughs> and featuring on the cover a cricket casserole. Now, animal scientists love global warming. Biologists, entomologists, zoologists. Here are a couple headlines. Study shrinks global warming. Study says global warming shrinks birds. Christian Science Monitor 2009. Followed, of course, in 2011. Bigger birds in Central California, courtesy of global warming by the uh, San Francisco State News. Then we have one, the lizard that outlived dinosaurs may go extinct from climate change. Somehow that lizard lived through the seven to 12 degrees Celsius swings of the ice ages, but they're gonna disappear now. And a sure sign that man-made warming is happening, climate change cited as shark attacks double. <laughs> now let me give you another practical example here of how great solar is. Uh, the uh, community colleges are the tip of the green spear. They are so green. Here's an example, Los Angeles Community College spent $42 million for solar installations. They paid $10 million per megawatt. The price of wind is about $2 million per megawatt, also very expensive, but this is five times the amount. They spent $42 million to save $600,000 in annual savings. A little math says the payback is 70 years on that. But oh, by the way, since you have to replace the solar cells after 25 or 30 years, this project will never come close to being paid back. But man, Green, what a great deal. And the U.S. military, the most powerful military force in the world, has become a tool of climatism. The U.S. government's going to invest $500 million to create an advanced biofuels industry. They're going to purchase biofuel made from algae for the bargain price of $26 per gallon, when normally they'd get it for $4 a gallon from petroleum. That's your tax dollars, folks. And Ray Mabus, U.S. Secretary of the Navy, says, we're going to be using American-produced, American energy that will create jobs in the United States, will create a far more secure source of energy for us, will make us better environmental stewards because we'll be contributing less to climate change. Now, the problem of Australian camel gas is a severe climate problem. There are more than one million feral camels rolling, roaming the outback 
in Australia munching up all the vegetation and emitting about 45 uh, kilograms of methane each year, which in a CO2 equivalent is about a ton of CO2 equivalent per year. But the Australian government has decided to solve this. In December 2011, they passed the Australian Carbon Farming Initiative Act, stating that the reduction of methane emissions through the management in a humane manner of feral goats, feral deer, feral pigs, or feral camels is now law, and you can uh, get carbon credits for this. So we're going to have people running around Australian helicopters <laughs> killing camels. I think this is a great idea. The Australians have something here. You know, what if we started shooting uh, elephants and buffalo and tigers and, man, we could even get the World Wildlife Fund to authorize the shooting of polar bears from helicopters, all in the name of carbon emissions. But the craziest thing is, is weather mania. Panic in the streets. Quote from uh, author Joseph Rahm, 2007, protecting dozens of major coastal cities from future flooding will be challenging enough Rebuilding major coastal cities destroyed by super hurricanes will be an almost impossible task. And there's going to be a new book out by Joe, Hurricane Mitigation for Beginners. And how about this quote from Reuters? Heavy rains, deep snowfalls, monster floods, and killing droughts are signs of a new normal of extreme U.S. weather events fueled by climate change. It's a new normal, and I really do think that global weirding is the best way to describe what we are seeing, said climate scientist Catherine Hayhoe of Texas Tech University. Now, I call these folks weather scaremongers. I've even got a theme song for them. It goes to the tune of Ghostbusters. When the weather's strange in your neighborhood, who are you going to call? Weather scaremongers. <laughs> now, Jay Lair and I have been studying this weather situation. And we've, we've gotten to the bottom of it. We know what's causing weather weirding, what's causing this from a climate point of view, and here it is. <laughs> bubble, bubble, toil and trouble. Now, there's a lot of wackiness going on, but there's a serious side to all this, and that is the tragic side. And the tragic side is $1 trillion. Uh, the Pew Environment Group estimated that last year the world spent, two, or in 2010, spent $243 billion to try and convert from traditional fuels to renewable fuels, and much more on total de decarbonization. For comparison, $120 billion is spent each year on total global foreign aid. That means the world is spending more than twice as much on decarbonization, chasing the mirage of trying to stop global warming. More than $1 trillion has been spent in the last 10 years, and we're on pace to spend another trillion in the next four. Imagine what $1 trillion could do for sanitation, for health, education, poverty reduction in the developing nations of the world, rather than spending, on, spending it on global warming fantasy. So with that, I ask you to join me and all the other speakers. Let's hasten the demise of climatism. Let's hasten the the return to uh, real science and the scientific method, and let's take the world's resources and solve the real problems. Thanks very much.